Wine gives you wisdom. Water gives you bacteria. <clears throat> so, how are we tonight? Uh, forgive this weirdness with the mic. The lavalier clip doesn't seem to be around, so I'm just sort of, I can do this or that. I'm just, we're going to give it a try. It looks stupid, but, you know, you can't eat decor, right? Lucky in my case. All right. <clears throat> well, okay. Uh, tonight we're going to be discussing the fourth commandment and all of you I'm sure have read the fourth commandment and heard it preached about, heard it proclaimed. I'm the Lord thy God who have brought you out of the house of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Strengthen your family. That's what the table of contents said. I mean, really. So, uh, Well, I mean, you, you know what the usual rendition of the fourth I keep wanting to say the Fourth Amendment. I'm sorry, I've been teaching constitutional law this week. I will probably slip up and say that today, tonight. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, I mean, the metrically they were. Ah, oh, he found it. He found, where did it come from? Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, do you want to know about search and seizure and probable cause? Wait. The defense attorney's over there. I'm so, he, yeah, he's pointing to himself. Yes. Yeah, so. um, anyway, well, um, am I coming through or hit or is it? That's right. Okay. I don't need a mic for y'all, I just need it for that. Good, okay. Um, well, the idea is the, the strict wording of the, uh, of the commandment. You know, uh, honor your father and your mother. Uh, but it does make sense that the chapter title sort of expands on that and builds on that, because that's very much in keeping with, uh, with the theology of the amendment. I keep on saying it, as it's been uh, developed over the centuries. Uh, so. Let's, let's look into it a little bit. The first three commandments are, I keep hearing myself, is that because this is turned on? There we are. Messes me up, there. The first three commandments uh, deal with the, the vertical part of the cross, if you will, the relationship of you to God. Uh, the remaining commandments beginning with this one, beginning with honoring your father and the mother, deal with the communal aspect, the horizontal arms or bars of the cross. It is how you relate to other people, how you relate to the community. And you, of course, know that these two things cannot be separate, because what does Jesus say? First commandment is love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and the second is like it, Honor your neighbor, love your neighbors yourself. So you can't divorce these two things. They are, they're really two sides of the same coin. And yet the first three commandments pretty much deal directly with the vertical, the others with the horizontal. Uh, as a matter of fact, according to tradition, the church fathers said, uh, how many tablets did Moses bring down from the mountain? Two, right? Uh, according to little t tradition, the first tablet had the first three commandments, the one dealing with your relationship directly to God. The tablet had all the others, beginning with, with the fourth. So that's, that's one way of keeping, uh, keeping them straight. Oh, he smashed them. He, he had a little fit of pique when he saw them. So did it break Probably more than I can count. So, <laughs> yes. Um, anyway. So, yeah, there's probably still some out there. No, I think I think they I think they ran off a copy. So, um, but the original ones got smashed. Well, so how, what does it mean to honor? And who is your father? Who is your mother? That's really what it comes down to. Um, well, most of you are from uh, are from other Christian traditions. You've been hearing this preached. Uh, you probably have a pretty good sense uh, of of how you would follow this commandment. Uh, in the Catholic tradition. So this is, in one way, this is going to be a fairly short talk tonight because you've, you've probably got a pretty good foundation for that. There are, there are a few things we can, uh, we can look at, though. Uh, 
One, I want to spin off and digress very quickly for a moment, though. Uh, some people, I, I did a talk on Mary on uh, Sunday. Some of y'all heard that. And I know that a lot of people are getting a lot of grief for, uh, uh, for Catholics worshiping Mary, right? And so I gave a long talk on how it's not worship. Uh, it's, it's veneration. There's a big difference. But one of the, uh, one of the issues comes up a lot of time with Protestants who, who don't like the idea that Mary was sinless that God saved her from sinning uh, before she actually sinned. He saves us from our sins after we've committed them. Uh, he saved her before she committed sin. And one of the best scriptural explanations of that is this. Uh, Jesus was Jewish, correct? No? Yes. All right. He was also God, which means he was the perfect Jew, right? He perfectly observed the law, including the Ten Commandments, right? One of those commandments is honor your father and your mother, right? The word honor actually in Hebrew is, if I'm getting this right, is kabed, which is the same root as to make glorious. Now, if you could make your mother sinless, would you do it? Well, he did, because he could. Uh, he, he perfectly fulfilled that commandment by making her glorious, by glorifying her, by preserving her from sin. So that may give you a sense of what it means to honor your father and your mother. Now, we can't, we can't perfectly do it because we're not God. But that gives you the standard to which we're supposed to live up to. Uh, but how do you go about doing this? Um, what if you have abusive parents? Uh, what if your parents themselves are not perfect? Because you know what? They aren't perfect. I think part of growing up is realizing that your parents aren't God, in a sense. Uh, in, in some families with a bad family dynamic, uh, tragically, children learn that sooner than later. Um, I myself have often wondered, uh, how does somebody who grew up with abusive parents, and not, I mean, it could be phys physically abusive, it could be spiritually abusive, emotionally abusive, psychologically abusive, somebody who grows up with parents who are like that, specifically if the father is like that, how can that person ever really come to terms with the fatherhood of God? I mean, that's got to be very, very difficult. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the answer for that. I'm not a pastor. I'm, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, what I do know is that we're all broken. But even in our brokenness, uh, your family is not random chance uh, any more than, than the sex that you were born with is random chance. Jeff, you're a guy. You're supposed to be a guy. You're always a guy. Can you imagine yourself not a guy? Okay, I mean, that's, that's part of your identity, according to the theology of the body. That's who you are. Uh, and, and that underlies a lot of the church's basic teachings on, on sexuality and such. Well, it's not happenstance either that you were born to the parents you were born to. That you were put here to somehow, some way, get along with them. And they were made your parents to somehow, some way, get along with you. Now, do we get that right? No, none of us does. And in some cases, it goes horribly, horribly wrong. But that's the ideal, because as Christ says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, does that mean that you have to stay in an abusive relationship? No, I mean, I mean self-defense. You can protect yourself. You can protect your, your spiritual well-being. But, uh, but it means that it, it gives you a standard by which you're supposed to try uh, to, to honor your parents. Now, although the commandment does not say parents honor your children, that's sort of the reciprocal of it. It's, it's built into it. That's part of it by implication that, and, and other places in the scripture, uh, provoke not thy children to wrath. Uh, you know, that's, that's very clearly said. So the church has always taught that this, this commandment is, almost did it again, this commandment is more than just about a biological child honoring his biological mother and father. This is really the template for showing honor and respect to all people, including children. Uh, and, and people to whom you are not specifically biologically related. 
Uh, it lets us start to see, for instance, father figures in other people, uh, figures of authority, uh, your employer, uh, your president, your governor, your mayor, uh, people in authority over you, uh, mother, the same way. Uh, think, of, think of the different roles of father and mother. And, and how you see fathers and mothers in, in different people. And this is, this is a very interesting thing. Think about this. Who, who is the ultimate father? That's a no-brainer. God, right? Every other father is, if you, if you will, an image or a reflection of the ultimate father. Uh, I may have, I can't, you know, I teach so many classes, I can't remember who I've told what. If I have said this again in this class before, forgive me. But... Think about one of the sacraments. Uh, think about baptism, for instance. It is a symbolic washing. Now, in Catholic theology, it's symbolic plus, because it's a symbol that actually does what it symbolizes. It's not an empty symbol. It, it's a symbol that accomplishes what it symbolizes. Uh, there are other... Uh, religious traditions that also have a type of baptism. I mean, John himself, uh, John the Baptist, that was certainly not the Christian baptism of sanctification that he was offering. It was a baptism of repentance. Uh, so it was not, strictly speaking, a Christian baptism, what John was doing. So you see baptism in other, in other societies, other non-Christian settings. And an anthropological reason for this is that it symbolizes birth. I mean, what is the first thing you do to a newborn infant? You know, you, you wash him. I mean, you know, he's, you know, he's got certain things on him. He needs to be cleansed of it once he's born. So you can see baptism is the type of emulation of, uh, of birth. What about, uh, we'll take the Eucharist in communion, when we share in a symbolic meal that is, once again, symbolic plus. Uh, it's, it's a meal that does, actually does what it symbolizes. So is this a copy of people putting aside their differences and sitting around a common table and sharing a meal? Because it's awfully hard to be in a fight or a war or something with people whose table you share, right? Except on Thanksgiving. Okay? With, you know, one so, I mean, there is some truth in that. I mean, God designed the human psyche, right? He knows what works for us. So the very fact that every sacrament <laughs> you can find uh, in human development a parallel to. Uh, baptism is born, is being born. Uh, confirmation is coming of age, of, of bar mitzvahing, if you will, of being included as an adult, as a full member of the community. Uh, communion is a meal. Uh, the sacrament of anointing is medical attention. But they, you don't just stop there, because at a deeper level, Communion is not an image of a real meal. The real meals that you have are images of communion. Communion is the true meal. It's the true template. So baptism is the true birth. Our physical births are, are the image of the true baptism. You with me so far? So who is the true father? God. So your biological father is just an image of that. Uh, he is a reflection, and therefore, the honor that you give to God, uh, you try to reflect that in the honor you give to your father, your biological father, and you further reflect that in the honor that you give in father figures, authority figures. The same thing for mother figures, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's, that's one way of looking at it. Um, also, let's look further into this communal element. The idea of the domestic church, and this is something that Americans should really be comfortable with. If you, uh, uh, if you look at even at Puritan and Separatist thought in the very beginning uh, of American history, that each nuclear family was seen as a little commonwealth. So, you know, the Puritans were on to something there, and I think they got that from, from their Christian life that what is the very basic building block of human society? It is the nuclear family. 
a mommy and a daddy who love each other so much that a new being is produced by that love. Uh, it's a society. It's a little miniature society, relational, all by itself. And from that, you move outwards to the extended family, the clan, from the clan to the tribe, from the tribe to the nation. And I think it's very interesting if you look at God's covenants through the Old Testament, that's how it works. His first covenant is with the nuclear family, with Adam and Eve. Uh, and then the larger covenant with Noah and his family. Then the Abrahamic tribe. Then the nation of Israel. And then when you get to the new covenant, the family of mankind. We're, we're, so it starts where it ends. We start with the nuclear family, we end up with the universal family. Uh, so you take the rationales, if you will, of the fourth commandment of honoring your father and your mother and you extend that likewise uh, to, to everyone that you find uh, playing a familial role to you in some sense uh, in your life. So I'll stop here and ask if anybody's got any questions or reflections or comments on that. Because I really don't have a lot to say on this, this subject. I mean, it's, yeah. You were talking about the uh, parents being as a figure to be obeyed and honored and so forth. And of course, regardless of the, the, the people's situation, the children, with respect to the abuse and whatnot. But to a certain extent, I mean, the children have a had no responsibility for themselves to a certain, a certain age, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, they can make a choice that, you know, to do the right thing, to follow the, the laws, the commandments, the way the whole, you know, family oriented because mm -hmm. it's just, they don't have to follow, you know, the, what I call the the downfall of being abused, you know, they, they want to continue the abuse part. I mean, mm -hmm. that's yes. That's just, to me, I, I'm going to say that's hogwash because I came from all of it. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and it is hogwash. I, just, I, and, made, a, I made a choice not to do, you know, beat my wife and beat my kids mm -hmm. and beat my dog, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because I'm frustrated or upset about something, that doesn't mean I need to take it out of my children or my family. Exactly. So, and. Yes, and there, there, are, there are several, as that's included in this commandment, there are several responsibilities that, uh, that parents have to their children. That if chastisement is necessary, uh, it should be very gentle chastisement because otherwise you will provoke resentment. You will, you will split this family asunder. Uh, you should not lead the child into a situation where he would commit sin or commit immoral activity. You know, that's, that is an abuse or a perversion of the parental relationship. So, and you know, and there have been times, I mean, we, in the last hundred years or so, I think we understand a lot more scientifically about the family dynamic. There's also been a lot of garbage published in the last hundred years on it as well. Um, but, you know, we understand mental illness better, we understand family dynamics better. But, you know, there have been times, in, in, in older times when our science has not been as advanced, when you know priests and others would say, you know, I'm sorry your husband beat you, but you have to go back and live with him. Um, you know, that's you're right. That's garbage. There's, there's no excuse for that. Uh, the you know the only possible defense that you can make for that is that people, including priests, are fallible human beings. They don't get it right every time. But but yes, this commandment is by no means license for someone to be abusive to somebody in their family, uh, and it is not. Uh, it is not a commandment to the person being abused to hang around and put up with it. Uh, you, can, you can actually be an occasion of sin to your parents if you let them continue to do that to you. Uh, so, uh, so we need to yeah, certainly dispel that point, and you're very right to do it right here and right now. Now, what is the right way of doing it? You know, every... Every relationship is unique, just like every person is unique. I don't think there's any magic bullet. There's no magic formula for it. But you need to be aware that you know, this is not licensed for physical, spiritual, or emotional abuse 
or a commandment to put up with it. It is certainly not that. Uh, you might even pervert the commandment uh, by doing that. So, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, you know, you have to tell this to some codependent people uh, that, you know, he really loves me, this is just how he shows it. You know, it's, you know, I mean, some, some people, unfortunately, really do believe that, and I believe it's probably due to the, the, the pressures of the condition of the situation on their psychology. But uh, I just want to be very clear on that one point. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would, when we first started this class, um, the fact that God was sort of regulated to God the Father mm -hmm. was driving me crazy because in my home and my family, the father figure just split. Mm -hmm. And I sort of came to this epiphany that that happens in lots of families. It's not just me. I'm not that special. And, um, and I was just like, you know, no, mothers are better than fathers. Like, I, I mean, you know, that was the space I was in. And I ended up having a conversation just this week, which you know how that happens. Our topic this week is all yes. mother and father, and that conversation happened. But maybe, maybe part of God the Father is because Father is what we need more. Perhaps so. I mean, um, it was just a, it was a thought that came out. Somebody else said it to me, just in that idea. And I don't know what it is about society, but it seems sort of universal, and that fathers feel more like they have the right to split or leave or... Well... I mean, do you think that's... A, I mean, like in America, it seems... Yeah. Per perhaps so. I mean, and it's, you know, it's probably a, a function of sexuality that, you know, that, first of all, men don't have to be around for the pregnancy. They have to be around for 30 seconds, and then they can go bye-bye. And, you know, I think the maternal bond, even after childbirth, is you know, is probably a lot stronger in some sense than the paternal bond. I mean, that's, that's just the way that biologically it works out. Well, and so, think about if mothers leave or if mothers are mm -hmm. abusive for, and I, my, my, I might be generalizing too much here, but it seems like we consider that much more perversion of nature and much more a terrible, <clears throat> you know, thing. Mothers are held to a higher standard. I suppose so, because they, you know, once again, as both biologically and anthropologically, it's worked out that mothers tend to be the primary caregivers. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, and certainly for, for eight or nine months after childbirth, I mean, men can't feed their babies. Mothers have a, you know, have a built-in bar. And, it's you know, so, hard to you know. see it in the paper, you know, all the mothers killing their babies and all. I, I can't understand it. Mm -hmm. but, I, but you know what, when a man does it, it's usually a stepfather, isn't it? Because oh. very seldom do you hear of a father killing his child. Yeah, it's because an interesting... They've already left. They're not... Yeah, it's... <laughs> yeah, it's a... Yes, you... I mean, seriously. I mean, really. Yeah, good point. You know, why bother to kill when you can just leave? So... Uh, I think the feminist movement, and masculization of men. Mascul yeah, the feminist movement, she says. Was that a hand? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when I read out of the book, Be a Man, the, the, the man has his role. And he has to sit there and to, to, you know, to take his wife and kids spiritually to God. And this is by Father Larry Richard. He says, but yeah, a man has also got a role too. He's got to sit there and get with the scripture and pray a lot. If he doesn't do that, how can he bring his wife and child up to heaven? You know, and he's supposed to give up to God. And this, this raises a very important point. As a spouse, what is your primary responsibility? What's your primary role? as a spouse, as a Catholic spouse. It's very interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure if anybody has actually put it this way for you. Really. Hmm? Family is a domestic church. Yes. And the man is really yes. priest. You know? Yeah, he, he is. As a matter of fact, that was, that was one of the... Yeah, uh, Sarice says that, and that's what I was getting at before I digressed, that the nuclear family is the little church. It's the domestic church. Mm -hmm. And who is the head of the church? Um, is the father figure or who is the head of the parish? The priest. Um, maybe Mark can help me with this, but at what point, it was sometime after Noah or maybe after Abraham that God said, okay, because you blew this covenant, uh, every family is not going to have its own father priest. Up until that point, the head of the family uh, was, was the priest of that family. Nope, from here on out, it's just going to be the Levites. Deal with it. Yeah. It was the golden calf that did it. So yeah, we're gonna God's gonna regulate this thing more. So, but but in a sense, he is still the 
you know, the father you know, figure, if you will, the God figure for the family. Mark? Good point. As 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 Mark was saying for the for the tape, that uh, that who is the who tends to be the disciplinarian in the family? It's the father. Uh, you know, if you get in trouble and the mother says, "Wait till your father gets home," uh, but to temper that, God also gives us a mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is more approachable and and a softer touch, if you will. So you get that nice balance. Um, well, yeah, I like the, I like the mother who says, you know. I, I, yeah, I like I like the mother who says, "Go out and bring me a switch." It's like, oh, that's a. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> hey, bring back a little twig, and oh, you can do better than that. So, Jerry. Yes. Yes. As a point of, of, and the wife is told to respect the husband. Yeah. There seems to be an assumption there in my mind saying the woman knows love and the man must learn. Oh, I like that. It says Jerry, the woman knows love and the man must learn. And I will add to that, and some men never learn. Uh, but I love that. I'm going to steal that. Um, and yeah, and, and once again, we're, we're looking at the husband-wife spousal relationship here, uh, that the, the feminist movement has, I think, distorted the teachings of St. Paul. They like to pass off St. Paul as a, as a misogynist, uh, and that, you know, wives be submissive to your husbands. But right there in the same passage, you know, husbands love your wives. And, and he says elsewhere, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? To death. He, he, he underwent death for her. So he's using different language to describe the, the main thing. Be self-sacrificing for your spouse. Which brings me back to my question. As a Catholic spouse, what is your principal duty? It's to do everything you can to bring your spouse, make sure your spouse gets to heaven. Very selfless thing. It's not for you to get to heaven, it's to make sure your spouse gets there. So, and I, I take that seriously. My wife calls me the saint maker. <laughs> He's done it again. God, give me strength to deal with him. So, yes. Um, so, you're all to be saint makers. That's right. Uh, uh, so, I don't know if that, that helps a lot. Yeah, the, how can, go back to one of our earlier points, how can anybody really have an undistorted, unperverted view of God the Father when every father here on earth is imperfect to a greater or less degree. It's, it's a hard one. It's a hard one. It, it's, I think in, this is one of the most concrete ways that, that the after effects of original sin still affects us. Uh, yeah, because this is, this is really relating in a, in a very, very concrete way as to how we see God and his fatherhood. Um, and it's just hard to do if, if you've come from a bad family like that. So, not necessarily emotional, but intellectually an act of will. Yes, and unfortunately, human love falls short of that sometimes. So, well, all times, but sometimes it's, it comes closer than others then. So, uh, I don't know, some of us you know, have, have pretty good parents, uh, some of us don't. And, yes, it is, and, and it's, a, it's a stumbling block. I mean, that's because, you know, that's why all of these commandments that deal with other people in a lot, in, in ways, make it a lot harder. I mean, you know, the whole marriage and annulment situation. Because what you do affects the community. It clearly 
affects other people. It affects the people around you. And they get splattered by it if you don't do uh, what you're supposed to do. And none of us does perfectly what we're supposed to do. So you can start to see now why you cannot disentangle the communal from, from God himself. I mean, you're two sides of the same coin, as I said. Other questions, other thoughts? Yes, sir. Uh, well, you know, the, the immediate thought is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, God is actually described one or two times in the Old Testament as being like a mother. Uh, you, you don't want to take that too far, obviously, because of the vast weight of things, you know, the fatherhood of God, th there's just so much theology uh, bound up in that. Uh, but uh, God is both father and mother in many ways. Uh, but that's sort of hard for us to to keep in tension, that uh, God, is, God the Father is pure spirit. He's not a biological male because he's pure spirit. He has no biology. Um, how do we, we can't really, just as I was talking about Jeff, who is a guy, can we think of a person who is neither a he nor a she? And so, once again, God is reaching out to us in that way by choosing to, to describe himself in the masculine. Uh, he could have put, picked the feminine in a couple of places in the New Testament. You, know, you, you see him going a little bit in that direction. Uh, but principally, uh, he has chosen to portray himself as a father. Um, and just to balance that out, uh, he gives us several mother figures. The Blessed Virgin Mary being one, the church itself as another. This is one that is often forgotten, that Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. Uh, and that he is giving himself up for his bride, the church. Uh, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Uh, read that hymn sometime, because uh, you, you cannot do away with those sexually determined roles without completely laying waste to Catholic theology. So it's, it's really wrong to call the church an it. She is a she. So. Yeah, you know, God is infinite. You are finite, therefore, you are never going to understand God. If you understand God, then you either need to see a psychiatrist or you need to see a theologian because your understanding of God is screwed up. Okay? Yes? Let me ask you a question. Uh, since Jesus was of Jewish faith, did that follow the doctrine of the Catholic Church throughout all the years that, you know, in the Jewish religion, they believe that the man has the power or he's in charge of everything. They don't have very few women, you know, that hold leading roles in their church. So therefore the men go to uh, synagogue mm -hmm. and the women just kind of just do whatever, you know, they have to do mm -hmm. to keep the Sabbath the Holy Day. Yes. So is that, is that, is that how our following along about women just come into play, or was it just circumstance? Yeah, I don't, I don't honestly don't know how much of that is just sociological and, and how much of it is actually a doctrinal requirement of the church. I mean, I know there are some things um, that, that women cannot be ordained. And the reason they cannot be ordained is because if Christ is the bridegroom uh, and he is a male bridegroom, and who is he marrying, the female church, what happens if you have to represent Christ, a woman. Uh, you have a woman marrying a woman, which biologically is a sterile marriage. It cannot be productive, uh, which therefore is not a marriage at all. So, uh, so there are reasons for that. Another, reason, another example uh, on the other side, the one that comes to mind immediately, and, and I think I remember mentioning this to you all before, um, there is a state uh, in the church called uh, that of consecrated virginity, that a woman can consecrate herself uh, to God and, and not be a nun. I mean, she'll be a lay woman, yeah. uh, but she will consecrate herself to God. Men cannot be consecrated virgins. Just can't. Sorry, if you're a guy, you're disqualified. Uh, so uh, so there, there are a few 
sex determinative things, but in terms of the actual male, female, familial roles, I will defer to the cradle Catholics about this one. Uh, you probably know more about it than I do. Yes? Can you go there one more time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A nurturer? A nurturer. Right. Uh, you, have the, you have the Father who is all understanding, all wise, all knowing. Okay? Uh, yet he is still love. Okay? God is love. Okay? So there's a nurturing aspect of it. So he must be both. Because he was a creator, you know. Uh, again, a nurturer, a conceiver who, uh, <coughs> who had the children. You know, so you have both mm -hmm. the male and female in who yes. he is. I, I think that he's why he is. He has created us as a family so that we can begin to understand who he is uh, in, in great fullness and that the more that we work together, you know, as a husband and wife, the more we begin to see him and who he is mm -hmm. and his and his act of creation. Well that's an interesting interesting thought. Yes, the, the Holy Spirit as, uh, um, in, in a sense, uh, having feminine characteristics. What was the word used again? Um, the nurturer. That's it, nurturer. Um, yes, there was that one of the examples. So. Yes, that's a good point. Um, now, the Holy Spirit is also referred to in the masculine, but I, I, I like that, and I, I want to say for the record, I'm doing some theological speculation here, and it's not my intention to engage in any heresy. So if I say anything that contradicts the magisterium, I stand corrected. Um, uh, in, in, I believe, the Gospel of John, I, I believe that's where Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the advocate, which is not that far from the nurturer. Uh, the Book of Wisdom is an excellent example. Uh, if, if you want to get really interesting and biological, I mean, even men have some degree of estrogen, right? Just as women have some degree of testosterone. So even a masculine figure like God the Father can, can safely be allowed to have some feminine characteristics without compromising his masculinity. He can still be God the Father. Interesting way of thinking about it. So. Um, once again, just speculation. Any other? Anybody else want to jump in here? So. Yes, that's what he was saying in the wisdom, in the book of wisdom. Right. So, other thoughts, other questions. Um, in the natural course of things, our parents die before we do, ideally. So I always tell my kids that. Ideally, I'll go first. <laughs> but um, so once, once, once parents are dead, that honor your, your mother and father mandate, is there any teachings on how to carry that out or, or how much? After they're gone? Right. Well, if you're talking about... Like venerate or... Well, you have to bury them. That's one of the precepts of the church. <laughs> uh, yeah, have masses said for them, yes. Well, <laughs> how Catholic of you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and this is this is an important thing. Hang on, we're right with you. Uh, to to talk about the Catholic funeral for just a minute because this is this gets so screwed up so much. The Catholic funeral is not to canonize the deceased. Oh, he lived such a great life. He was such a great person. He's smiling down on us from heaven right now. No, uh, that's very presumptuous of us. We hope he's in heaven. Uh, it, it's good to remember the good things he did, uh, but to just automatically to assume he's in heaven, um, very, very presumptuous. The purpose of the Requiem Mass is to pray for the soul of the deceased. Uh, this is why, if you remember the funeral of Ted Kennedy, uh, a huge pro-abortion, quote-unquote, Catholic politician, if you watched that Mass, he was canonized. I mean, not formally, but you know, you know, that was a scandal to the faith. You know, did he repent at the end? He was talking to a priest. Maybe he did. We don't know. I hope he's in heaven. I hope Hitler's in heaven. I hope everybody's in heaven. Uh, is everybody in heaven? I, you know, 
I don't, I don't know. We cannot assume that. Uh, the church has never, ever taught as a matter of doctrine somebody to be in hell. But that doesn't mean that nobody is. Uh, I mean, Judas, if you look at some of the things Jesus said about Judas, you, you know, it looks pretty likely that he is. But, um, so, yeah, so having mass said for your parents, praying for your parents on your own, uh, praying for any of the poor souls in purgatory. So what in, what, in fact, if your parents already are in heaven and you're praying for them? Well, if they're in heaven, you don't need to pray for them. Uh, but your prayers won't be wasted. They will be applied to somebody else in purgatory who needs those prayers. Uh, this is part of, of the communion of the saints. This is what we do for the deceased. We pray for them. Uh, they pray for us. So, yes, yes. There is, uh, uh, y'all know me, I'm a closet goth, right? I do a lot of gothic writing. I've got a great article on the theology of Dracula if you ever want to read it sometime. Um, but I think, it is, I think it's Valpurgis Night. It's either Valpurgis Night or All Saints that there is a picture of a cemetery somewhere in Eastern Europe. At Taken at Night, there is a candle on every single grave. And it is the, the whole graveyard is lit up. It's one of the greatest pictures. As a photographer, I wish I'd taken it. Hmm? Yeah, Poland, certainly. Eastern, any, any place in Eastern Europe, they have that, that practice. And, and what are those candles there for? They're, the, you know, they're representing prayers arising for the deceased. Yeah. Kelly, was that close to answering your question? Um, in some ways, yes. But the nice thing about it is that the traditions and the way they raised us and I don't know like our responsibility when it comes to taking the traditions and continuing them or mm -hmm. what know, sort of honoring their parents. Yes. Honoring their memory. Yeah. But and at the same time I ask her specifically what does the church say so I mean, yes. you know. How you know and this is where I think it, it would come down to you know, to you, you know, probably nobody knows your parents better than you do. What would they like? What would they consider to be an honor? Um, you know, I, I do think that praying for them is probably the most important thing. The rest of it is largely, I think, for you. Mm -hmm. um, yes? I was going to say, um, I had a friend uh, who died very young. And uh, the family, some of them were Catholic, some of them were born. But the way that the family honored him for dying so young, was that his favorite thing that he always wanted to do and was never able to do was a scavenger hunt. So once a year on the anniversary of his death, as close as possible, they would invite all of his friends and family to come and have a scavenger hunt. Um, and the Catholic Church doesn't say that you can't do uh, these things that, that just might seem natural to you uh, to do. For example, if you're Mexican, um, the Day of the Dead celebration, they often will create like a little, like get a cigar box or something, a little box, and create a little box that has a little uh, um, scene in it that celebrates the life of the person who's gone. So that's part of their tradition. Mm -hmm. One thing about the Catholic Church, because it's come over the cross of so many different cultures, that there's a lot of different little traditions uh, in different places um, that may be celebrated like an Irish or a Polish or a Mexican. It's not celebrated by everybody else, but for some reason you couldn't do it. If, if it's something that speaks to you and you think we're honoring your parents. And that's, you know, that's one of the great geniuses of Catholicism. There is, you know, you've, you've heard me talk a lot about can't do this, can't do this, have to do that, have to do that. But there is plenty of stuff that, that you have free reign on. Uh, as uh, G.K. Chesterton once said, that uh, uh, if Catholicism is an estate, yes, there are some very fine, well-kept gardens, but there's plenty of room for hunting and fishing as well, if that's what you want to do. There is a great deal of flexibility uh, within the Catholic Church uh, for you to follow as dictated by your culture, by your society, by your uh, economic means. If you want to have a mass set every day for a year for them, uh, and, and basically in your own family dynamics. Or even thoughts, or, or 
sharing with somebody else, you know, what he did or she did is a blessing. <clears throat> blessing to you and blessing to them. I think that, I mean, there is a possibility that it could get pathological, that, that in some circumstances you just found your, find yourself emotionally unable to let a loved one go. And you know, I, I think at some point, if you are behaving in a pathological way, you need to realize that and get help. Um, the, the example I think of, and this, this dealt with a pet and not a, not a person, but we had a, had a friend and her cat died. And she could not let the cat go. It was summer, and you know she wouldn't bury the cat, and it you know for like three days, and you know, you know, you know, and obviously if there's if you were focused in and and it became you couldn't get through that day unless you did the scavenger hunt. You know, you'd just go crazy or something. Then you know that might be taking things too far. It's it's I think giving death too much power over you. Uh, when when death, I think once we get to the other side, we'll just see see how weak a barrier that really is. Uh, Mark and I were talking earlier during a walk that Catholic theology uh, is is one that's most conducive to the ideas of ghosts because you know we really don't know what purgatory is like. You know, can somebody, you know, in some circumstances come back? Uh, for Catholics, I think you can't discount that possibility, but. We don't want to sit around waiting for it to happen, or certainly not try to make it happen. Ouija boards, no, no. So, uh, yes. I want you to repeat something because I'm trying to write down on this bit. I'll try. You said the Catholic funeral is the purpose of the requiem mass is to what? I'm going to that it's to pray for the soul of the deceased. It's it's not to canonize them. Uh, and, and think about how great they were. It's to pray for the soul of the deceased. So, so. obviously, you're depressed enough already because Josh Love likes mm -hmm. even more depressed. Than Catholic. Yeah, <laughs> I've never been to a Catholic funeral, so I have no idea. But I'm like, so. Uh, well, these days, these days, it's very cotton candy. You know, we'll we'll sing uplifting things. I, that most Catholic masses today miss that mark. Uh, they they do. Some miss them worse than others. But uh, it's you know, once again, it's not. That doesn't necessarily have to be depressing. Um, you know, it's just that the job isn't done. They're in purgatory. We get to keep praying for them, just like we were praying for them earlier. And they're praying for us. And if they're in heaven and they don't need our prayers anymore, our prayers are not wasted. Uh, so, uh, yeah. One that might be interested in knowing that Father McDonald had a very interesting blog just very recently, one day this week, I think, about the purpose, the true purpose of the Requiem Mass. Where do you think I got this from? <laughs> sorry, I, thought it, I thought it good enough to, to, sorry to repeat. Sorry to ruin that there. Oh, well. well. He also explains that the wake and, and other points during the grieving process, are the, those are the proper places to do the eulogies and, and to have the good time and so forth, but that the Mass itself is is the place to pray for the repose of the Oh, we can give you the address. It's fine. Is it calm or water? Southern owners page that blogs by It's in the bulletin board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think so. It's in the bulletin. Yeah, yeah. That's why I don't remember exactly what it is, because I click the bulletin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought what you were getting back, getting to is we, we, you know, we get to the, you know, the once saved, always saved idea, and, you know, he's such a great person, he's got to be in heaven. <sighs> you, know, the, you know, as Catholics, we, we cannot be positive of the fact that somebody is in heaven. We hope they're in heaven. We know that God is a merciful God. Um, you know, this, this sounds a lot crueler than once saved, always saved. And once saved, always saved, you know, he was a Christian, he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, therefore he's in heaven. That's a very comforting concept. It's a very comforting notion. The problem is, if it's wrong, then it's a false comfort. Uh, you know, we believe God's merciful. We believe he is going to work with us. We believe that he is going to continue to perfect us. Uh, so, certainly the Catholic funeral mass is, is a time of hope. Uh, it's a time to trust in God. But... Uh, but we have to temper that with the fact that this person still may not be completely perfected. God's work still may be going on in him after death in purgatory, and therefore we continue to pray for him. So, and and I think in a way, once again, that reminds us how of how little importance death is.
it's a it's a very transient barrier. So. One question I had, and I was raised as a, a cradle Catholic, and uh, you know when they say that uh, you should pray for the dead. Yes. In generalized terms, pray mm -hmm. for the dead. Okay. And you go to church every Sunday and you pray for certain people because you feel like, well, I don't know if they're in heaven or not. Yes. Okay. Well, the people that say, you know, if you pray for just generalized, and then they have that day, Old Souls Day or All Saints yes. Day. Yes. Yes. Depends but on which one. Tell me and I'll let you know. if you go to Mass mm -hmm. and you, you go to confession, you go to Mass, you go to Holy Communion, you've just done a great service for the person who might be in purgatory. Mm -hmm. Well, is that better than praying for them all the time? Why not do both? Mm -hmm. so. But see, I never yeah. heard that that day was especially set aside yes. to help somebody get out of purgatory. Right. All it's kind of the yeah. impression that if you go to confession, you go to the communion, you go to, to the mass and everything, uh, or even go to the cemetery mm -hmm. afterwards, this is a big deal. You, they might get out of purgatory. Does anybody else, do, do any other cradle Catholics know more about this than I do? Mark? Yes. I can tell you that you can do that same thing every day. All you're talking about there is an indulgence, and you can get an indulgence for a holy soul of purgatory every day if you met the proper conditions. Yeah. Uh, but all souls day is a special day where you meet those particular requirements. That's all you're talking about there is those are the particular requirements for that particular indulgence. Every day you can go to communion and go to confession and say a rosary and do the same so if you have a whole lot of people you know that died, maybe you would consider that. So we would, the prayers are just now for a great fail. So, so the more that you lend yourself to walking with Christ and become in the image of Christ, putting on the mind of Christ, uh, the more likely uh, your prayers will be heard. Is that making sense? You don't look happy right now. Well, it's just, it's just an odd thing that recently mm -hmm. I just found out about. This. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe it, I was behind. Maybe I was out of school that day that the nuns taught this. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the last 40 years, the nuns have not been teaching a lot of this. Um, so let, let me go over real quickly. There are two days in November. Uh, November the 1st is All Saints, which is what gives Halloween its name, uh, the Eve of All Saints, All Hallows' Eve, Halloween. And that is the day when we celebrate all the saints who are in heaven. Uh, especially the ones who don't have their own particular feast days. For instance, uh, your father, who, who may have gotten out of purgatory by that time, may be in heaven, he's a saint. And therefore you're celebrating him along with all the other saints. Uh, the 2nd of November is All Souls Day. And that is the day we uh, pray for the holy souls who are in purgatory. They, they haven't ascended from purgatory into heaven yet. And so they're still in need of our prayers to to make that leap. And as, you know, as Mark points out, I think, as Jerry points out, it's not that you can't do this on any other day. It's that this is the church really calling attention to it and reminding you to do it. Uh, and really, the entire month of November, uh, you, you have that emphasis going on. But the, the day itself is All Souls on the 2nd. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I got a question. I, I went to my first wake with that guy, Al. He was a Remember him? He was at St. Peter Claver. He had a choir over there. Okay. He died. His funeral was so big, I had to have it here. But I went to his wake. It was the first time I've ever been awake. And at the time, I just thought it was a great excuse to get drunk and uh, and, and remember the good times with about a, about a dead friend. But then, and then, but the next day, he went to the funeral. I've been to many funerals and buried a lot of people, but I had never in my life squalled as much as I did hmm. at this funeral. And and so I was wondering if the wake was purposely done to make you do it. What is the purpose of the way? Because I know what it did to me. It made me reflect on what a great guy and what a mm -hmm. great voice was. I mean, mm -hmm. I also remember the family this guy was. And then and it turned around and I mean, my, we buried my great grandmother before that. that I've known her all my life and I've only known him for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just let loose at his funeral. Well, I think that's what you're seeing, that uh, uh, that it's, it's great to remember people and to remember what a great guy somebody was or a great person or a great parent, but you don't want to get carried away with that so far that, sh that, you, o that you fail to remember the fact that this person was in fact a fallen human being like the rest of us uh, and still may have a ways to go. So what the church does is to separate those two ideas. So the fond remembrance time is the wake, 
and the let's get serious and don't forget to pray to God for him is the funeral. Uh, so um, I don't know if there's, a, if there's an intended relationship there or not, but so Teresa's pulled out her, her book and she's... Yeah. It's uh, this right here, and then it's also the book of Maccabees right there. Oh, okay. You can see, uh, you can okay. We have invocations in honor of the holy wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there are more souls released from purgatory during the consecration of the Mass than at any time. Christmas is the day of the year when most souls are delivered. Then feast days of our Lord, Our Lady, and great saints. Souls receive much grace from prayers offered for them on their birthdays, day of baptism, anniversary of death. The more we work for poor souls on earth, the more others will pray for us, and the more merciful will Christ be with us when we're in purgatory. There you go. That is the Pieta. Whoops, I'm scattering all over the place. I'm going to mark it with that. So. Well, I mean, I, I, I yeah. just begs the next question, you know, I mean, just, just falling back to, because I lived in New Orleans for a while, I pretty much came of age there, mm -hmm. this year, the first time in my entire life, I could actually celebrate Mardi Gras and not be a complete and total poser, because <laughs> I'm actually observing Lent this year. Hmm. So, I mean, it made me think back, like, all these years, I was nothing but a poser, I was just using it as an excuse, you know, and so was everyone else. And so... Having said that, you go to a funeral in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. They sing a dirge on the way as they walk that casket to the boneyard. On the way back, they're dancing Dixieland jazz. And I mm -hmm. think that's like, it's like backwards, and I don't know if that's... That's a, that's a cultural thing, I think, and, and I don't know. You know, New Orleans is that interesting blend of the French and the Spanish and a little bit of the English. Uh, it's the Big Easy, so... So yeah, I mean, I. Is that, is that like an after wake? Or, I mean, what, I've never heard of an after wake. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I do think it, but I, but I do think it works. It works, and that it does distinguish two different things that you don't really get in in the modern church anymore. And it's it's, uh, you know, I, I think maybe in Protestant circles, it's you know, we're sad because he's go he's gone, but we're happy because he's in heaven. You may reverse that a little bit in the Catholic Church um, that let's don't, you know, we don't want to be three cheers and fireworks and everything because he still may have a little work to do before he gets to heaven. But let's also remember fondly that he was our friend and he was a good fellow. So uh, the fact that they're both, both emotions are needed, they're acceptable. Yeah, this reminds me of a story that a very devout woman I know who was a parishioner here for some time, her husband got rotated over to Germany now, so they're over there, uh, used to homeschool their kids. But she, she was great, she was something. And she would fall asleep every night praying a rosary for the souls in purgatory. And one night, she says, she woke up and this woman was bending over her bed and, and you know, she'd never seen her before in her life. She's bending over her bed and said, thank you, and then disappeared. And uh, my friend Patricia, uh, what did she do? Oh, she was, she, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't terror, it wasn't rejoicing. It's like, what's going on, huh? What, who are you and what are you doing in my bed? Huh? And then she woke up the next morning and thought, oh, you know, this must, must have been the next person in line to get out of purgatory. I didn't even know who it was. Okay, was it a dream? Was it a vision? Was it an apparition? You know, it, you know, this is our religion. It, it certainly could have been real. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. But uh, how many Star Trek people do we have out there? There's a Star Trek Voyager episode. And in the tag of this episode, you know, the Enterprise had been split into two dimensions or something. And Harry Kemp, the Harry Kemp from one dimension was killed. And the Harry Kemp from the other dimension took his place on the other Enterprise. And so as the show was ending... You know, he was sitting there sort of scratching his head, and Captain Janeway said, you know, what, what's wrong, Harry? And Harry said, well, you're my captain, but you're not really my, my captain because I'm from the other dimension. It's just all so weird. And Janeway says, you're in Starfleet, Ensign. Weird is part of the job. <laughs> Roll credits. So, yeah, 
Yeah, that might have. Generation or the original? That's Voyager. Oh. Voyager. Okay. Yeah. You got a problem with Voyager? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it just you were you were eventually dating the one from Voyager. I mean, the only split one I was thinking about was when they had that little dog with the spikes that came back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, that one I remember. That's one. I That's the original. The enemy within. Yeah. yeah. So they, they killed it at the end too. Yes, they did. Are you saying then, Buck, you're a Catholic <laughs> ensign? Anything is possible. Is yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean that. That once again, you know, it's all nice to talk about purgatory and angels and stuff, show, angels showing up. But I'll guarantee if something like that happened in, happened in real life, something that our faith tells us is true and is real, it would still probably freak all of us out. Well, you know, if an angel showed up right here, man, I, you know, we'd all lose it. That doesn't mean it can't happen. That doesn't mean it isn't true. Yeah, so. I, I, do, I do see uh, people that I have not seen before because I pray this prayer every day every day. And it says here, um, I want to just share it with y'all. Um, our Lord showed St. Gertrude the Grace that the following prayer would release a vast number of souls from purgatory each time it is said, Eternal Father, I offer thee the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus, in union with the masses said all throughout the world today and for all the holy souls in purgatory. Amen. And that's a very short prayer every day. And then sometimes I wake up and I see a vision of somebody smiling. And I haven't seen them before. And I'm not scared. You know, and I say, it might must be. Maybe she's released or he's released. And people young, some people old. So. Well, and also, can I talk? Can I, is it okay? Are you rolling? Can I talk again? No. So. Hi, I'm Buck. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're not here? Okay. Um, so, um, but at any rate, so your your motion sickness bags, we will come around to dispose of later. Uh, when is your prayer, and and not just for a prayer for someone in purgatory, any kind of prayer at all? When is your personal prayer the most efficacious, based on what Sirius has read? Can you take a wild guess? Right after receiving communion, oh. you're, you're as united to Christ as you're going to get in this life. Then, so you know those are when you've got your prayers are the most powerful. Right after you get baptized. Or, or for those yeah, who that'd be a good one. Yet, I think it's during consecration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the idea of spiritual communion, uh, uh, Christ, I can't receive you right now, but I would like to make a spiritual communion uh, virtually. Of that, I mean, I'm not, not, not to change the subject, but we, we, we get our baptism on, on the seventh on that Saturday. When do we get first communion? About 15 minutes later. Yeah. Well, 30 minutes later. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to get slammed. I mean, uh, you're going to get, you're going to get, uh, the unbaptized are going to be baptized, confirmed, and first communion within about a 30 to 45 minute time period. Yes? When do they confess? They have to confess. Uh, those who are getting baptized do not. Uh, no. No, baptism wipes away all sins. Yeah. Now, those of you who, uh, we're getting a little bit into our preview of, uh, of Holy Week now. Uh, those of you who are already baptized, who are already Christian, your first confession will be the week before. But to my knowledge, nothing stops you uh, from going back. Liturgist here, can confessions be heard on Saturday? Yes, Saturday. Okay. Uh, so, Good Friday. So, uh, oh, and we've got an examinations of conscience back there. So, you will have... Uh, you will have made your first confession the day before Palm Sunday. Uh, if you want to go back to confession on Good Friday or Saturday before the Easter Vigil, you can do that and you know, confess what's been going on the previous week. Make yourself really clean. Will they have confession? Yes. Yes. So, so you can... Uh, uh, I always thought that confirmation came after First Communion. Uh, no, that's... Normally, and, and you're thinking mainly with children, and the timing of confirmation has always been subject to debate. Um, but with adults, it's, it's, very, it's absolutely clear that baptism, confirmation, first communion. Um, so, and we'd all be better off if we were just baptized. Then we wouldn't have to go through confession. Yeah, <laughs> we're all sitting here wishing we'd never been baptized. But see, we got 
And you call yourself a Christian. <laughs> well, 51 years of uh, thinking about it. Mm -hmm. so, um, but, that's, but aren't you glad you have that available to you? Yeah, this goes back to whatever. I just I want to know why. Okay, the, what you do on this earth, you know, uh, y'all don't call it second price, but what do you call it? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, like as Protestants, it's like you're accepting Christ, but you don't y'all don't call it that. I mean, I'm not sure what you call it actually. Born again. Born again. Yeah, well, they yeah. don't call it that though. You don't call it. Well, that. it's it's not. It, I mean, it's in the Bible, so we yeah. we yeah. you know we will refer to it sometimes, but it's not yeah. a usual yeah. statement. And you never said backslide. Nobody ever says backslide. That is a Protestant term, yeah. I think, or a Protestant concept. Um, the the idea is that. And, and I'm, let, me, let me get very fundamentalist here. We'll take a very fundamentalist congregation someplace, uh, very literalist and very evangelical. Uh, the sinner's prayer, for instance. Well, the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible anywhere. Uh, you can leave the Bible corner to corner, and it's not cover to cover, and there's not a sinner's prayer. So when do you get saved? The, the Catholic would say, once again, remember the Catholics play with space and time. We do weird things. All right, uh, like in the mass, you step out of time and into eternity, things like that. So, as a Catholic, I would say I have been saved through the redeeming action of Jesus Christ, which was applied to me in my baptism. I am being saved, and it's an ongoing process as God is continually giving me actual grace and calling me to repentance and to sin less and less and to do God's will more and more. And I will be saved, future tense, at the end of time uh, when, when God raises me and makes me whole and, and brings me into heaven where I can enjoy the beatific vision. Um, the, the idea of I've said the sinner's prayer, I've accepted Christ as my Savior at a specific moment in time, and from that time on there is nothing that can take place that can take me out of God's love or out from under his covenant and send me to hell, that is not a Catholic idea. Uh, God always lets us be free to turn and walk away from him if we want to. Um, now if we do that, which we all do every day to one extent or another, then the way we get back into God's good graces is to go to sacramental confession. Uh, so we can never be assured. As, a Catholic would call that presumptuous. Uh, and Luther, poor Luther gets bashed a lot, I know, in here. But, but Luther, Luther once said that if I'm really saved, I could rape ten nuns, hundred nuns, here in front of the altar, and I'm still going to heaven. Um, and, you know, that, that's an alien concept to the Catholic point of view, uh, that Christ says be perfect, we're called to be perfect, we're never going to get there, but we have to keep trying. And Christ also says, he who perseveres until the end will be saved. Now, Calvin tried to make an end run around that by saying that God will make sure that we persevere. Uh, my answer is God's not a rapist. He's a lover. And if we, you know, and if we don't want to accept his love, he's not going to make us stay in the relationship with him. Uh, he's a respecter of our free will. That's not what I was trying to say. I didn't get through. I didn't get through. I was <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she did it. She did it with the backslid stuff. She did it. I mean, that's not what I was trying to say. I'm okay. just saying, okay, uh, you're become Catholic yeah. and you're baptized or already baptized and you're like not saved or working towards it. Yeah. This is what I guess I can't understand. Okay, you're the person that's supposed to be working for it, doing for it. Why? And I know it's probably in one of your scriptures or, or something that'll soon be mine <laughs> that, that says it's so. But why do people have to pray when this is supposed to be you uh, loving God, getting closer to God? I, I don't understand that part. I mean, why do we have to pray for that? They're, you're supposed to be doing that yourself. Well, I'm, I'm, I think you I'm missing. You understand what I'm saying? Why do people have to pray? Why do you have to yeah, pray for me? No, for in, like if you're in purgatory. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm just saying this is your your walk with God. You know, I, I yeah. kind of don't get that. 
All right, let me, let me try a little bit. I've got some other people who want to jump in. Uh, first of all, to correct one thing, remember that we, we can't earn our salvation. So it's not, and, and this, is a hard, this is a hard thing for me too, the idea of we are having to work to earn God's love and work our way into heaven. That's a no-no. Um, you know, that, that it's called grace. It's freely given to us. All we can choose to do is either choose to cooperate with that grace or not. So that's where the, the free will comes in. As for prayer, that yes, indiv as an individual, your responsibility is for your own soul. And I can never change that. I can never force you to hell against, or heaven against your will. Uh, I can never force you to hell against your will, for that matter. Um, but it, it's like running a race, okay? You've got to cross that finish line yourself. You've got to run it. You've got to be in shape enough to do it. But near the end, when we're all getting worn out, we can help drag each other across the finish line. We've all got to get across that line on our own. But it's a communal affair. That, uh, and that's what the communion of the saints comes for. That you know, Just as you pray for people who are here on earth now alive, you can pray for people in purgatory too. It's like when you were saying, go across the finish line. Who do you got cheering you across the finish line? That cloud of witnesses. Yeah, and, and that boosts morale, if no other reason, you know, to know that people are, you know, are wishing you well. Uh, that, that Christianity is a communal idea, which brings us back to where I started, that most of the commandments deal with how we relate to other people because we live in community with others. Uh, so is that helping at all? Well, yes, but you kind of contradict yourself to me in a way because you're How? saying, okay, it's your free will and you're saved by grace, but then you're saying you're not. I mean, I'm really kind of confused. Okay. So we have a lot of people talking here, and we got some. We got a very serious question here. Uh, um, all right, the, fir the first step. Uh, you cannot earn your way into heaven. You cannot work your way into heaven. Uh, the only way you get to heaven is because God gives you grace. But... God is not going to force you to accept that grace. Uh, if you accept it, that is your free will. You can choose to accept it or reject it. If you accept it, uh, then you also have to accept God's working in your life. You, you can't say, yes, God, I want a free ticket and I want to continue to sin. Uh, so the part of the acceptance is to let that acceptance show through your works. That doesn't mean that those works earn you a place on the bus. Does that help? No, I still think it's contradictory, but whatever. <laughs> you can just let people go on and do whatever. Yeah, Mark, want to try? Oh, yeah, oh boy, I'm going to sit Mark on you now. You're going to be real sorry now. Everybody else may have something they are more concerned about. Yeah, we'll, we'll try. We'll, if, if this one doesn't work, we'll move on to your next point. Did you ever see the uh, Fellowship of the Ring? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a scene when Frodo is dying. They've that uh, what's her what's her name? Arwen is trying to 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 get Frodo to her father in time for her father to heal him, and you know she's just fought off an attack from the Nazgul and things are looking bad and Frodo seems to be on the way out, and it look, she knows she's not going to make it, and so she says. Please let whatever grace is given to me pass to him. Good example? So, yeah. It's a self sacrificing type of thing. Yeah. I was going to say, too, that uh, God seldom works alone. Okay? And uh, 
love covers a multitude of sins. And anytime we receive love someone from someone, let me make this other comment too, that in order to change someone, they say you have to love them first. And it's in that action of gratefulness and love <coughs> that a person can perhaps find true contrition. Okay? It says God never works alone, and he allows us to work in, in, the, in his behalf, in their behalf. That uh, uh, Many times you'll ask your husband to, to pray for you. And it's a most sincere prayer, and it's a very loving prayer, and it's for your very best. And you're liable to receive that prayer in the grace of God, and perhaps have the, have the grace to become contrite, or to see what you need to see at that particular time. God doesn't always speak to us, you know, in, in prayer, loud and clear. A lot of times he'll use someone dear to us, or next to us. There's another... Uh... Jerry, while well, Jerry's speaking, it reminded me of another scene from The Lords of Discipline. And Pat Conroy, uh, from a Catholic family, I'm not sure how well he lives out the faith, but you know, he's steeped in Catholicism. And there's a scene, do you know what The Lords of Discipline is about? It's, it's about, it's very loosely patterned after the Citadel in Charleston, and it's about two plebes, uh, actually more than that, but they're going through their plebe year at the Citadel. And they're going through hell night. And hell night is the night that the upperclassmen just let them have it. It's the beginning of the school year. And uh, the Lords of Discipline. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the book it was very descriptive. And, you know, so they are, you know, they are tearing these plebes to pieces and finally tell them to, you know, go back into their, uh, go back into their barracks and get ready for an all-night march or something. They're kicking them up the stairs and screaming at them and, and, Two of these plebes who have never seen each other before in their lives just fall, collapse into one of the rooms together. And it's like, do you think they'll give us a minute? I don't know. What do you think? Well, maybe we better get ready. Here, have some water, fast. And, uh, you know, my name's Will. My name's Trad. Trad, do you think we can be friends? Trad says, we already are. And they go stumbling out for the rest of Hell Night. Does that give you an idea of Christian fraternity? You know, how, you know it's, is that not praying for each other or, you know, you know working out, applying the, each other's graces to each other in adversity? Um, as for working your way into heaven and having free will uh, versus not having free will, trust me, you'll never understand it. It's a mystery. can't be figured out. You know, the church has said, if anyone teaches you don't have free will, that's a heresy. The church says, if anyone teaches that you can work your way into heaven through your own free will, that's a heresy. Well, gee, guys. So you're not going to understand it. You just have to accept it. Does that make sense? I no. Just yeah. It yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good. Good. Don't move. You're fine. You're in a good place. Yeah. You, yeah. Remember that the definition of heresy is you can understand it. Okay. Uh, and and the three best examples. How can one equal three? How can a human being be God? And how can you be predestined and have free will at the same time? If you can give a rational, comprehensible explanation for any one of those three answers, it's, or any one of those three questions, it's the wrong answer. All right, just is. Was there a hand over here? Yeah. Um, one, one thing that sort of put that to rest for me, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about a real ugly, bad family member of mine in the past, and why should I pray for him to get out of purgatory? Does he deserve that time? Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was sort of my question. And part of part of my understanding was that there's peace, like there's a lack of peace and a lack of rest that we have on earth, and we can't go to heaven with that. And so purgatory is that place to make peace with whatever happened on earth. And so if I were to pray for my grandfather, my my bringing love to that situation and my bringing God in that situation, that begins to chip away at whatever mess it is that we're in. And so for both of us, really, that purgatory time, you know, like, we're, we're both going to have to serve that time and, and come to some kind of peace. And even if he's not in heaven or in purgatory, he's in hell, I still, I mean, I, I guess ultimately it was a selfish thing, but you know what I mean? Like, so if we pray for the dead to get out of purgatory faster, 
especially in our relationship with death and dying and all that, it might bring some peace to the situation and therefore... In any case, that, that answer put it to rest for me and I was okay to move on, but... Well, two, yeah, two thoughts, two thoughts for Kelly. First of all, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, you pray for them if you'd want them to pray for you. And second one, I'll borrow, borrow from Father McDonald. Do you know somebody you hate or dislike? You would, you would strongly prefer not to have dinner with them ever again? You know somebody like that? Does anybody here not know somebody like that? Okay. Now imagine this. You're in heaven with them. Is that how you imagined heaven to be? Do you want to go to a heaven when that person's in it? And don't, don't, don't try to weasel out. Well, maybe heaven's a big place. No one have to see him. No, you have to see him up there. Okay. Um, if you have that thought, gee, if that's, you know, if, if heaven means having to hang around him, I don't want it. That shows a couple things. Number one, it shows that you probably don't understand what heaven is. And number two, it probably shows you're not ready for it yet. Yet. So, and then how do we fix that? Well, we do it by praying for yourself and also praying for the person that you don't like too much. So, coming to terms with that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, very dangerous prayer. Yeah, forgive other, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. Well, what if we don't forgive them? Well, then, that's how we're going to get forgiven, as in not. Oh, I'll stay as long as you want. We've got, we're at 833, so... Uh... Oh, well, thank you.